Assalamu alaikum, this is Hannah Zuberi and you are watching Muslim Network News. Tonight we'll continue our coverage of ongoing Israeli aggression in Palestine. Israel continues to bomb hospitals and clinics, killing frontline workers and patients. The United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says Israeli bombing has damaged six hospitals and two clinics. This includes a clinic run by Nobel Peace Prize winning NGO Doctors Without Borders. A health clinic and a Palestine Red Crescent Society facility was also bombed. People killed in airstrikes on Gaza include its top neurologist. Dr. Moin al Ol was killed along with his five children as Israel bombarded his house. The head of Gaza's COVID response team, Dr. Ayman Abu al Auf, was also killed in the bombing. The only laboratory in Gaza that processes COVID test results is inoperable after this Israeli airstrike. Psychologist Raja Abu al Auf was also killed in the bombing along with her children. So far, close to 200 Palestinians have died in Israel's bombing of Gaza, while hundreds have been injured. Israel has reported killing more people in the last one week than Hamas has killed in the last 10 years. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said Monday that he has seen no evidence presented by Israel of Hamas's presence in the office of the Associated Press. Israel bombed the 12th floored building last week. The Associated Press had been operating from it for the last 15 years. We'll be discussing the latest situation and the condition of hospitals in Gaza later on the show. Keep watching Muslim Network News. U.S. President Joe Biden expressed tepid support for a ceasefire as the Israeli bombing of Gaza entered its second week. Yesterday's statement was the first time the White House officially made any mention of a ceasefire in the ongoing violence. Many Democrats have been pressuring Biden to do so. The move came after Biden spoke by phone with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The White House's official statement said that the president expressed support for a ceasefire to help end the fighting. However, Biden did not call for a complete end to the hostilities. He reiterated that Israel had the right to defend itself, but Biden also encouraged Israel to protect innocent civilians, as it did so. The United States provides over $3 billion in foreign military aid to Israel. Israel also benefits from about $8 billion worth of loan guarantees. Last month, Biden approved a $735 million sale of missiles to the country. This was before Hamas sent any homemade rockets into Israel. According to Newsweek, the arms sales included the same kind of precision-guided weapons that have targeted civilians and media in the Gaza Strip over the last week. Interfaith organizations in the United States are issuing a call to stop the violence in Palestine. A petition signed by over 40 Jewish and Muslim faith leaders called for an end to the bombing of Gaza. The group statement deplores the violence between Israel and Palestine and notes the disproportionate response of the state of Israel. The violence began with the attack on Al-Aqsa Mosque on Laylatul Qadr, one of the holiest nights of the year for Muslims in the month of Ramadan. The statement calls on both government leaders and private citizens to do everything in their power to de-escalate the conflict. Chicago-based Muslim human rights NGO Justice for All has issued a statement and petition to U.S. President Joe Biden to cancel a $735 million sale of missiles to Israel approved earlier this month. Justice for All has also asked the U.S. to not stop the U.N. from passing a resolution ending the bombings in Gaza. The Biden administration did this three times during the past seven days. In addition, Justice for All is calling for an end of support for Israeli apartheid in Palestine. American tax-exempt organizations are part of a network funneling money overseas to kick Palestinians out of their homes. Nahalot Shimon is an Israeli settler organization targeting Palestinian families in Sheikh Jarrah. 
And the Israel Land Fund is a leading tax exempt organization doing the same. Since 2007, the Israel Land Fund has bought land in Palestinian neighborhoods and throughout occupied East Jerusalem to sell to Jewish settlers. The Israel Land Fund is not acting alone, but is supported by donors in the United States who get tax deductions for the money they give to the Israeli charities. From 2009 to 2013, U.S. charities funneled over $220 million to Israeli settler organizations. U.S. donors make tax-deductible donations to these charities in the United States. They, in turn, funnel the money to organizations in Israel that force Palestinians out of their homes and lands. The Israel Land Fund was started by Aryeh King, who is the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. He's also an Israeli settler who lives in Ras al Hamoud. The Israel Land Fund was started by Arye King, who is the deputy mayor of Jerusalem. He's also an Israeli settler who lives in Ras al Amud. King and other right wing officials descended on Sheikh Jarrah on May 6 to support the settlers' push to kick Palestinians out of their homes. U.S. nonprofit central involvement in Israeli settler movement has sparked calls amongst Palestinian rights advocates for the American government to investigate these organizations. Over 4,000 police officers in Paris deployed tear gas and water cannons to disperse pro-Palestine demonstrators on Sunday. This was after an administrative court banned the march due to fears of violence. The Association of Palestinians stated that they refused to silence their solidarity with Palestinians. Earlier, representatives of the association told agency France Press that France is the only democratic country to forbid these demonstrations. America has too many vaccines. U.S. President Joe Biden plans to send an additional 20 million doses of the COVID vaccine abroad by the end of June. This includes for the first time shots authorized for domestic use only. The U.S. supply is beginning to outstrip demand for the vaccine. This will be in addition to 60 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine. In related news, New Jersey and California said that they would disregard federal government advice to stop wearing masks indoors for the fully vaccinated. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control issued the guidance last week. Both states have decided to keep their indoor mask mandates in place for public spaces for now. The U.S. Supreme Court will be taking on its first abortion case since Justice Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed. Justices will begin hearing arguments for Mississippi's bid to ban the procedure in almost all circumstances after 15 weeks of pregnancy. The case begins in October when the court's next term begins. The decision to take the case suggests the court's strengthened conservative wing may be ready to roll back the landmark 1973 Roe v. Wade ruling. That law ruled that the Constitution of the United States protects a pregnant woman's right to choose to have an abortion without excessive government restrictions. Dead bodies buried in shallow graves are surfacing in the state of Uttar Pradesh in northern India. Hundreds of shallow graves along a riverbed were exposed due to heavy rains. Relatives of the dead have not been able to cremate the bodies due to a shortage of wood and fear of contagion. Indian religious practice requires cremation and in some cases allows proper burial in deep graves. Navneet Sekal, a state government spokesman, denied local media reports that more than 1,000 corpses of COVID-19 victims had been recovered from rivers. India's two big states, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, have a population of 358 million people. They're among the worst hit in the virus surge sweeping across the country with devastating death tolls. A mob of Hindu extremists allegedly lynched a fitness instructor in the Indian state of Haryana. Asif Khan, who was returning home after buying typhoid medicine with two cousins, was attacked by a group of 35 men yelling religious slurs against Muslims. The 25-year-old family alleges that he was forced to say Jai Shri Ram 
a prayer turned war cry. He leaves behind three children and a wife. Indian police have arrested six people but have ruled out a communal angle to the case. The Chinese embassy in Turkey held a drawing competition for students to promote interest in China. The effort backfired when students' artwork depicted the oppression of Uyghurs in occupied East Turkestan, renamed Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region by China. The China in My Dreams contest was started with Turkey's International Science and Cultural Foundation, the country's Ministry of National Education, and the Chinese embassy. The contest rewards Turkish high school students whose artwork best depicts the theme of ties between Beijing and Ankara. Turkey is home to more than 50,000 Uyghurs who view their fellow Turkic nation as a refuge and advocate for their religious and cultural rights. It is estimated that there are 12 million Uyghurs worldwide. A drawing in the contest by a girl named Aisha Zauki depicted Chinese police imprisoning Uyghurs and hanging them from trees. Another drawing depicted Chinese language slogans, including let's invade and assimilate Uyghurs in every way possible. Arizona Republicans are feuding over the third recount of ballots in last year's U.S. presidential election. The recount started because of false claims by former President Donald Trump of election fraud. The controversial audit is being conducted by Cyber Ninjas, a Florida-based consulting firm. Trump lit the latest fuse on Saturday by falsely claiming that the entire voter database of Maricopa County has been deleted. Stephen Richer, the Maricopa County recorder, who is a Republican, called the claim unhinged. He denied Trump's false claim, saying that he had the voter registration database open in front of him at that very moment. Nonetheless, Republican leaders of the Arizona State Senate are following Trump's lead and pressing forward with the controversial audit. The audit of 2.1 million ballots is taking place in the Veteran Memorial Coliseum. It was temporarily halted to host a high school graduation this week. It will resume May 24th with the goal of finishing it in about 14 to 16 days. Biden administration seeks to reform immigration policies. How is he doing on his promise? Ali Khalaf and Saleha Farooq have a response. 28% increase in children to the border. There is a sharp rise in migrant crossings at the Mexico border into the United States. These crossings include unaccompanied minors and families with young children. The migrants mostly come from Latin and Central America. However, a large number of people are also flying into Mexico from India and taking the bus to the U.S. border. Early this month, at least 90 migrants, including a group of unaccompanied minors, were found waiting in La Jolla, Texas. Now, there is a new system in place. It starts at the port of entry in El Paso, Texas, allowing pre-screened asylum seekers to enter the United States on humanitarian grounds. However, the expulsion policy, started by former President Donald Trump, is still in effect. President Joe Biden has not revoked it. As such, people can still be deported. The Nakba is a term commonly used in describing the Israeli apartheid imposed on Palestinians. What does Nakba mean? The answer lies in this report by Ali Khalaf and Saleh Farouk. The Nakba, or En Nakba in Arabic, literally means catastrophe. It began in 1944 when the Jewish terrorist group Haganah started terrorizing Palestinians to leave their homes. By 1948, this resulted in the mass exodus of at least 750,000 Palestinians. This number was half of the 1.4 million Palestinians who lived in Palestine during that time. The Nakba today continues, 
in the shape of illegal Jewish settlers on Palestinian lands. During Ramadan of this year, Jewish settlers forcing themselves into the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood symbolizes this ongoing Nakba. The Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood is the last surviving neighborhood of Palestinians in Jerusalem. Some historians, however, trace the beginning of the Nakba to an even earlier time. In 1799, Napoleon issued a proclamation offering Palestine as a homeland to Jews under France's protection. This plan for the French did not materialize during that time. Later in the 19th century, the plan was revived by the British. In 1917, the Balfour Declaration declared British support for a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. Today, there are 13 million Palestinians, and a majority of them are refugees or children of refugees. Only 5.2 million Palestinians actually live in Palestine. None of these displaced communities, however, have a right to return to their homes under current Israeli laws. On the other hand, Jews anywhere in the world can claim a home in Israel. This is the Nakba. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis. So stay tuned. We'll be right back after these messages. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse. Walk a mile in my shoes. Assalamu alaikum. This is Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid. Walking up and down the world's largest refugee camps, I met Sister Fatima. Well, I'm calling her a sister. She was just a teenage girl, my granddaughter's age. Her parents were slaughtered by the Burmese military, and she was dragged by the Burmese soldiers to their hut and all night long, she was violated. She lost consciousness when she regained and in the morning and soldiers were themselves away, she ran and hid in a vegetable patch. Some people saw her, gave her clothes and took her four day long walk to Bangladesh. Who will speak up for her? Who will stand up for her if not you and I? It's our responsibility. It's our duty, brothers and sisters in humanity. And that's why I like you to support Burma Task Force. I'm a volunteer for it. But Burma Task Force is standing up to stop this genocide, violation of our sisters, you and I, are free, they are not. Please stand up, work with Burma Task Force and donate today to Burma Task Force. Together, we can do it. Assalamu alaikum. Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. Welcome back. A Palestinian currently living in Turkey discusses why and how the international community must enforce measures of protection and safety for those facing violent persecution in the region. Listen to real-time on-the-ground updates regarding the crimes and killings facing Palestinians today. Let's go to Saleha Farouk for details. Over to you, Saleha. 
Once again, much appreciated, Hena. Today, we're very happy to be joined by Mr. Mohammed Al Qatawi, who is a human rights advocate as well as a Palestinian currently living abroad in Istanbul, Turkey. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Mohammed. Thank you very much for your for hosting me. It's a pleasure to have you. Now, as you might know, the United States Secretary of State recently spoke with the Foreign Minister of Pakistan. And um, after the meeting, unfortunately, we're hearing more of Palestinian fo or sorry, Pakistani focused updates from the conversation rather than updates from the United States, of course, regarding the crimes against humanity uh, occurring in Palestine and what the international resolve is. So I just wanted to begin by asking you, why do you think the world is emphasizing on the importance of a United States role in addressing the human rights situation at this time? First of all, unfortunately, the international reaction toward the Palestinian cause is less than what we expect. Uh, I don't know how many times we should witness war crime committed into uh, the Palestinian people, especially the Palestinian people who are living in Gaza Strip. Uh, to to condemn the the, the occupation, uh, I've been witness three uh, aggression uh, against Gaza uh, during the 2008, uh, 2012, and 2014. Uh, during that aggression against Gaza, uh, the Israeli military used disproportionate um, forces against the the civilians, uh, according to the to, to, to recent reports raised from Gaza, uh, we, we heard about, uh, we have like uh, more than 200 people have been killed. 45% uh, of them, they are from children and women. And uh, while also we have 1,400 and above uh, are wounded. Uh, in comparison with the, 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 the action, uh, they keep blaming the Palestinian for firing uh, rockets and when I say rocket, uh, it can't be like this. It's it's a homemade rocket. It's not the rocket like uh, the Israeli firing uh, fired to uh, toward the Palestinian with that massive uh, forces. Okay, I appreciate you going into the different casualty situation occurring in the region right now. And I do think that's something that's very important that needs to be highlighted. So thank you so much for that. Now, of course, in your own right as a human rights activist where you are, if you can tell me a little bit about the challenges that you face in spreading awareness about bringing about change, any kind of challenges that you face in the process of doing so. The, the challenges that I face uh, in, uh, outside Gaza, it's not too much to, to be mentioned, like the youth in the Gaza Strip. Uh, actually, right now, um, the people, they are uh, surrounded by the fear and surrounded by the violence. But the, the, when they wake up after this violence uh, end, uh, and we hope it will be ended soon, inshallah, uh, the people who realize the, 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 the size uh, of the, the damages around them, even uh, by losing some, some beloved one or losing an infrastructure building. Uh, and let me focus on, on, on something about the youth in Gaza. Uh, Gaza Strip, it's not that big city. It doesn't uh, contain a lake or mountain. Uh, it doesn't contain... Uh, a wonderful green area or park for the people to get uh, more entertained. Uh, it's, a, it's a tiny shore located to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, uh, in comparison with the building around the world, it's a medium-high building. Uh, nowadays, Israeli demolishing everything, demolishing our memories uh, for the youth, especially that towers. Let me back to the, to the towers that... Uh, claiming by the Israeli side that uh, contains offices for Hamas. And let me also focus here, not all Palestinians are Hamas, neither Fatah. They are, some of them, uh, not affiliated for any political or uh, any, any, politi any political group. So the youth here uh, use this uh, towers, which is uh, has uh, generators, special generators, uh, during the turn off of electricity, uh, 
they are used to go there because there is uh, youth centers, NGOs, INGOs operating from there, um, media agencies. So youth goes to these offices to enhance their skills, to uh, to use their forces and to use their uh, good mentality uh, to improve their community. Nowadays, uh, all these facilities have been demolished. Uh, even the road, uh, the good road, uh, the Rimari Street has been totally uh, vanished. Uh, Al Wahda Street, uh, even the the Shore Street, the, the 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 street located next to the beach. Uh, or the Cornish, it's not, it's, it's cannot be say the Cornish, it's a uh, only nice uh, street next to the, to, to, to the Gazan beach, uh, has been attacked nowadays. So the people uh, all over the world need to know, uh, here we are in not equal, equal uh, equation. Uh, we are talking about uh, well-organized and well-trained army against the brigade group. They train themselves to self-defense, not to attack. Otherwise, the people of the world, or the, let's focus on the US administration, keep saying uh, the Israeli has the right to defend themselves and blame the, the, the Palestinian people for firing rockets. And why the international community do not focus on the people who are vanishing and uh, destroying their dreams, their memories? Everything uh, in, in Gaza uh, actually have been goes on. Within the second, uh, you might be under the rubble. Within the second, all your dreams, all your future will be vanished, just like that. So um, I'm not talking about rebuilding Gaza. Rebuilding Gaza is not a solution. The solution is to be standing, stand with the, uh, with, the, with the rights, to support the people, to give them uh, uh, their rights to, to decide the decision. Why the Israeli uh, still controlling Gaza border, Gaza uh, entry from the sea, from the, from the air, and from the land? Gaza considered as one of the high density populated area in the world. It consists of like uh, two million people and above. Uh, they cannot go out and in from Gaza uh, freely, just like you. So, thank, you so thank you so much. I really appreciate the insight. And I think that having such um, updates from on the on the ground situation helps us understand more the plight of the people and what they're going through versus what we might be seeing in the headlines. Uh, I want to just take you back to your previous answer about international support. Uh, so, for example, Pakistan's parliament uh, unanimously adopted just recently a resolution on Monday that condemned Israel's brutality in the region. So when it comes to such shows of support from global nations, uh, what does it mean to get that kind of international support and uh, these calls for diplomatic action from different world governments? Is there enough calls to action being put out there from global governance? And if there is more support from these federal leaders of power, what would that mean for the Palestinian people? What kind of effective change can be brought out if more global leaders stood up against the violence and if more of them called for substantial action? Um, regarding the recent, what, what recently, uh, even for and the people, uh, from the people of the of the any country or on the street or in the political side uh, it will any uh, let me say it's it's good to raise the morality and spirit of the Palestinian people to keep defending and standing up after all this sadness and violence they are facing so what we asking now is uh, first of all to lift the blockade over Gaza. Israeli declared that this unilateral disengagement since 2005, but still control everything, the export, the import, uh, the people movement, even the medicine, which is required by, 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 by nature of the human being. It's uh, 
not everything is allowed. Uh, currently, they are attacking or targeted, actually, uh, before uh, a couple of days, the central laboratory, uh, which is belong to the Ministry of Health. Why? This is the only laboratory uh, used to uh, make the PCR for the people uh, in, inside, the, inside Gaza. Uh, and the uh, political level, uh, we, uh, we hope that the, the politicians and the, the governments uh, of a free countries to make kind of lobbying to raise this uh, unfairness uh, about the people of Gaza because they must know that the, the people of Gaza, they have nothing to lose actually. They keep squeezing us in the corner and asking us to be calm which is unacceptable. And let me, uh, quoting here uh, 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 a statement from uh, Naomi Chomsky shared in 2012 uh, from an old man in, in Gaza. Uh, he said, you are, ta you are taking my water, burning my olive trees, and uh, killing my mother, imprison my father, stealing my land, uh, Compounding my uh, my country and starving us, humiliating us, and after all of that, you blame us to uh, because we are firing a rocket, which is unfair and injustice. All the human rights organization, all all UN resolutions respect the human rights, and we are human. Uh, the, the 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 international community should respect us and, and uh, deal with us as a human. We need to live uh, normally, just like you. We need to have freely to, if, if you would like to travel, uh, why I should wait in the queuing line uh, for three, four, or five months until I have approval to uh, cross the, the Sinai? Uh, why I don't have an airport? Why I don't have uh, ability to import the goods that I needed? So. All of this must be uh, used as a tool to make more pressure uh, on the, uh, the Israeli side because all of the country right now, they have a membership within the United Nations and they must have the ability to do such things. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you uh, sharing the quote by Noam Chomsky, which is a very impactful statement of his. Now, uh, just um, within the last few minutes that we have, you're currently in Turkey and um, leaders such as the Turkish leaders right now are being very vocal about the ongoing atrocities in the region. Now you talked a little bit about this, but at, the at this time, what kind of uh, solutions or proposals uh, are being brought to the table by leaders in Turkey or such similar leaders that are calling for action? If, for example, um, an arms embargo or sanctions on different members of the Israeli forces, what kind of solution is needed right now for the Palestinian people? If you could just share in the last few minutes that we have. Uh, the, the right solution from my point of view is to, it's time to take an action and stop saying words, uh, violence, leads to violence. Uh, if I, uh, a cat in the cage, and keep isolating her from participating and playing with other cats, and forbidding her from taking food or water, after a while, this small little cat will be like a tiger and will attack as soon as possible. So we need to take an action, lifting the siege from Gaza, allowing the people to live normally, enhancing the economy, and let them to take their decision and live their life just like your people within your countries. Very well said. Thank you so much, Mr. Mohamed Al-Qatawi, who is a human rights advocate, advocate uh, in Turkey. Thank you for your time with us today. Thank you very much for your also. You're very welcome. Back to Hena Zuberi in the newsroom. Thank you, Saleha. Before moving on to our next analysis, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back after these messages. Our fellow Americans, 
Right now, the COVID-19 vaccines are available to millions of Americans. And soon, they will be available to everyone. The science is clear. These vaccines will protect you and those you love from this dangerous and deadly disease. They could save your life. So we urge you to get vaccinated when it's available to you. That's the first step to ending the pandemic and moving our country forward. It's up to you. Friends, our world is pulling together like never before. We're making huge sacrifices to keep one another safe. Scientists are working nonstop to develop COVID-19 vaccines and treatments. A vaccine will get our economies moving. It will tell our loved ones we're safe again. But we have challenges we must address. Right now, huge pharmaceutical companies are keeping the vaccine research a secret. They're deciding how many vaccines get made, how much to charge for them, and who gets vaccinated. This will no doubt leave billions of people behind. Pharma companies are putting profit, not people, first. Yet, Billions of dollars of taxpayers' money is funding their work. We cannot let the CEOs of a handful of pharmaceutical companies decide our future. We need a vaccine that everyone can have free of charge, no matter where you live or whether you're rich or you're poor. We need companies to share all their research so we can make enough safe vaccines for everyone. We need a vaccine owned by all of us. To end this COVID-19 pandemic, we need to pull together once more. Bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. With the death of two senior doctors, Gaza's medical system has been damaged in many ways. Four hospitals run by Gaza's Ministry of Health had sustained damage, along with two hospitals run by NGOs, two clinics, a health center, and a facility belonging to the Palestinian Red Crescent Society. To discuss this in detail, let's go to Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid, who's with a Ministry of Health spokesperson in Gaza. Over to you, Imam Mujahid. Thank you, Hina. 
It's a sad situation in uh, Gaza. Uh, today I spoke to Dr. Madhat Abbas um, about this situation and how hospitals in Gaza are coping with constant bombing by Israel. Uh, my here's my conversation with Dr. Madhat Abbas. He's a spokesperson for the Department of Health in Gaza. Yes, sir. alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are injured uh, being taken care of right now in Gaza? Well, we have been living in a siege for 15 years, ended by Corona for one and a half a year. And now we have this aggression for eight days. The health system was already fragile because of the, the blockade imposed on us. And then today, after Corona, it became very complicated, the situation. And that was then crowned by the aggression, which have resulted in more than 2,000 casualties and more than more than 200 killed. Out of them, we have 58 children. And out of the 2,000 injured, we have 50% women and children. So because of the very limited capacity in the Palestinian Ministry of Health, we are putting beds on the corridors, what we call extra beds, to expand the very limited capacity. The ideal number of beds in Gaza Strip of hospitals should be 4,000, so we have half this number. So for that reason, any any events like those, like this aggression, usually are forced to put beds in the corridor. That's become very ordinary in Gaza Strip. And we're also doing the same in the intensive care units to expand the capacity of the ICUs, which was already, again, full by patients of corona plus the ordinary cases that need intensive care units, and now we have this aggression on top of that. And uh, But let me just in two minutes explain what's the meaning of siege in Gaza, because not everybody knows what's the meaning of siege. In fact, a siege in Gaza, it's not only closure, closure of borders, no. A siege is something much bigger than this. A siege, it means that a student, a university student in Gaza, cannot pay his tuition fees or cannot join the university because of poverty. This is because of the siege. A siege for a businessman who cannot travel outside to make a deal or business. This is another shape of the siege. For a patient who has cancer, who needs to have radiotherapy, and because we have no radiotherapy center in Gaza Strip, he has to travel outside, and he waits a permit from the Israelis, usually it's denied. For that reason, again, those people may die while waiting this permission. This is another form of the siege. The public staff working for the government are taking 50% of their salaries for more than six or seven years today. Again, this is siege. If you want to travel outside and come back to Gaza, you may take six months to arrange for leaving and four, three months to arrange for coming back again. This is the only place in the world where you can have such a long time to make it out inside and inside Gaza again. A farmer who has implanted some crops willing to export them outside to make some money may at the end of his season find the borders closed and instead of selling one kilogram of strawberry for five dollars he may sell it in the local market for only five dollars for 0.5 dollars i would appreciate if you uh, tell us a little how this siege impacts uh, the hospitals and the students and the supply of fresh physicians and their training if a doctor cannot make it outside to attend any conference and training outside. That would be a very complicated and long process. And if I want to invite some doctors from outside to come and help us together, some can succeed to make it, but the majority can never be able to come to us. This is another shape of the siege. We have no electricity most of the time in our hospitals, except through generators, which are operating by fuel. And the fuel is very expensive. And again, when there is a closure, you can't get fuel for those generators. On the other hand, we have shortage of medication in the Palestinian Ministry of Health. That was almost representing 50% of uh, shortage of the medicine and medical supplies required to operate 13 governmental hospitals. That was during the blockade before Corona. After Corona, the situation worsened, and now it's much more worse than before. So there are so there are fifteen hospitals uh, for two million people in Gaza. Thirteen hospitals, yes. Thirteen, 13 hospitals. not fifteen. Yes. yes. The Guardian paper, uh, the British paper Guardian, is reporting that six of those hospitals 
are damaged because of the bombing. Can you confirm that? Well, well I'm sorry, I, I slept for maybe one hour. I, have, I was not updated, but I'm quite sure that there is a primary health center called Al Shawa was totally annihilated in the last few days. And another one called Al Daraj was again annihilated totally. It was leveled on the ground. And yesterday at 6 p.m., they have attacked uh, the uh, building across from the Ministry of Health and a Rimal Clinic, which is another big uh, primary health care clinic, which contains the uh, central laboratory of Gaza. Both were partially damaged, and now there is no service offered in those places at all. Uh, and there are some other uh, hospitals that were partially damaged. One is called Beit Hanun Hospital. Uh, this is located in Beit Hanun city at Gaza North. And another hospital is called the Indonesia Hospital. Again, it's in Gaza North. It was attacked partially by the Israelis. The other, the last one was a quarantine center, which is near Atrafah city, uh, where we received the returnees who have corona from Egypt and coming to Gaza. And again, that was partially damaged by attacks in an area of land near that center. So these are the places that I come to know till now. I don't know if something happened in the last half an hour because the breaking news here are every second, you know. They are very quickly and rapid. And so you, you cannot, the numbers, you, you, you never make sure that the, the number that you have is fixed because every second there is a new casualty and there is a martyr killed in Gaza. Do you know any of the, uh, you know, reports are also saying some of the senior doctors uh, have died because their homes were bombed along with their children. Did you know any of those physicians who have been killed? I know both of them. The first one was a retired doctor. He, is our, he was our colleague in Ministry of Health and he, he retired six years ago. His name was called Dr. Muhammad Al-Alul. They attacked the building where he lived and he has almost four children, all the family of six members, they, they died at once. The other block, which was another disaster, it was a building of four floors inhabited by many families and they were in, inviting some relatives to stay with them maybe because they thought that it's a safe place to stay in. And then it was attacked at midnight without any sort of pre-warning. And the people were inside, and suddenly it was attacked. It was leveled to the ground. The height of that building was 27 meters, and suddenly it became four meters. There in that building, Dr. Ayman Abu Auf, he was a consultant of internal medicine, one of the best doctors that we have in Gaza. He used to work in Shifa Hospital. He was the head of internal department medicine, internal medicine department. And he was the one leading the battle against corona in Gaza Strip. And he's the one who was teaching students, medical students, teaching them medicine. And also he was teaching the postgraduate doctors to get the postgraduate degrees to become specialists in Gaza Strip. Now, he with his wife and his three children, they were attacked during that night. Uh, he passed away with his wife and two of his children. One of his children was a daughter in the third year of faculty of dentistry. And she was supposed to marry after one month, by the way. The last thing that we heard from her was a message that she sent to her friend. She told her, I'm still alive. Please come to clear me out of this rubble quickly. But we were not able to make it. And she died under the rubble before we getting her outside. So the doctor, the doctor passed away. And my colleagues prayed on him yesterday morning in Chippa Hospital. And we still feel sad for the loss of those doctors too much. Because that doctor will affect the negatively. This is a very big loss that you cannot substitute in one minute. That will never be substituted. So sorry to hear of uh, loss of your colleagues. Uh, tell us, is this has been a feature only this time when Israel is bombing Gaza, that hospitals are being targeted and some hospitals are completely destroyed? Or Israel has done this earlier in the past attack? Okay. No, that was done many times, sir. That's their history. It's full of massacres. It's full of crimes against health facilities and against our colleagues. We know them by names. We know them. I don't have all the names now, but of course, I remember how many, too much people were killed. You know, one day, if you have time, I could tell you the story which happened in 2014 
I was working and I was a head of a hospital called Alexa Hospital. And a friend of mine came, he said, doctor, I was the director of that hospital that day. And my secretary was outside. And he said, doctor, do you know that you are the only one remaining in this building now? Please get outside. The Israelis are attacking heavily near us. And we're not sure that you are safe to stay in office anymore. I said, okay, the doctors were afraid to come to the hospital because it was very dangerous to come to the hospital. So I said, okay, let me go to Gaza City, pre prepare an ambulance for me, and let me go to Gaza City where I can bring some doctors from the central Shifa hospital. When I, was, when I went down, down I, I, I sent my secretary back home, and I went down, side, down in the yard of the hospital. I saw many families running and getting inside the hospital, civilians, just want to find a shelter in the hospital. They thought that the hospital is safe. This is what they thought. I went in the ambulance and I, I, I rushed to Gaza City to bring more doctors. And when I reached Shifa Hospital in Gaza, everybody started to hug me. Yes, Dr. Methar is still alive. Yes, he's still alive. And they start to hug me. I don't know why they hug me. I don't know why they are kissing me. I don't know why they are saying, Alhamdulillah, you are safe and sound. I said, what happened? He said, you don't know, doctor, that your hospital was attacked and 50 were wounded and three of your colleagues are killed? You don't know that? I said, no. And suddenly it was in the news, but I did not hear the news. That my, the, when Once when I left the hospital, it was attacked by heavy artillery bombardment. And all the people who were sit, taking shelter in the hospital, they are children and women, they were attacked and 50 of them were wounded and three of my colleagues were killed inside the hospital. So oh, sorry. The rest of the story is that my wife, my wife and my children were listening to the news. That's the rest of my story. My son, I have only one son and three daughters. My son Salah is now doing a specialty of neurosurgery in Jordan. All my, my children are doctors. So Salah, he's the only boy. He, he said, let me go and save my father in Alexa hospital. And he took the car and he was driving very quickly to a very dangerous area. I spoke with my wife just to assure her that I'm still alive. And she started to scream, oh my God, Salah, my, this, my, my son is called Salah. Salah has come to you to save you from that hell. Try to save my son quickly. And she was shouting and crying. And I spoke with him and thank goodness he was not out of Gaza City. And I returned him back peacefully home again. So it's not the first time they attack hospitals. And when was the that time, uh, the, the hospital? When that happened, your colleagues passed away and you survived. When, when was that? 2014, yes. 2014. Have, yes. You, have you, let me ask you, have you be, have you ever been to any uh, uh, Israeli hospital? How do you compare uh, Palestinian hospital in Gaza with Israeli hospitals? No, I haven't gone there before. Okay. We couldn't go. We couldn't go to Al Aqsa Mosque to pray, although it's only eighty kilometers far from us. We couldn't go, sir. That's not possible for us. This is not allowed. Okay. So Beth Salim, uh, which is the Israeli human rights organization, and Human Rights Watch, uh, they are both calling it apartheid. Is there a medical apartheid in your eyes? Sure. How could you explain killing a doctor with his children while they were sleeping in bed during night time? Of course it's apartheid. Of course. They are committing war crimes. How could you justify the number of children being killed? You know the story? Let me tell you. I'll be honest. Benjamin Netanyahu will certainly be arrested and he will be go to jail. The only way for him to save him, himself from jail is to kill more children in Palestine. This is the only justification from his point of view. When he kill more children, then he will become a hero in front of his government. So he will make a coalition and he will change the law to stop the, the court, the Israeli court, putting him in jail because of corruption uh, charges. This is, this is For me, this is the only justification because we have done nothing to deserve killing our children while they are in bed. One of the, 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 the martyrs is a boy or is a girl of two years old. What the hell has she got to do with that conflict? No, no, no. These are war crimes and apartheid and genocide as well. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Madhat Abbas. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Back to you, Hina. Thank you so much, Imam Mujahid and Dr. Abbas. That's all from our Washington studios tonight. Keep watching Muslim Network TV. For more, visit our website, muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.